Chapter 1 The New Doctor Late one October afternoon in the year 1924, a badly dressed young man looked eagerly out of the window of his railway carriage in the almost empty train. Manson had been travelling all day, but the last stage of his long journey to South Wales moved him to great excitement as he thought of the post, his first as a doctor, that he was about to take up in this wild country. Outside, the rain beat down between the mountains on either side of the railway line. The tops of the mountains were hidden by a grey sky, and their sides, which contained many coal mines, looked black and cold. Night was falling, and no trees, no grass could be seen. At a bend in the railway line, a bright red light from an ironworks suddenly came into view, lighting up a number of men who were working with all their strength. At once, a sense of power filled the mountain valley. Manson drew a deep breath. He felt an added call to effort, a sudden hope and promise for the future. It was dark when, half an hour later, his train reached Drineffi. He had arrived at last. Manson jumped from the train and hurried out of the station. In the street, an old man in dirty clothes looked at him carefully and asked, Are you Dr. Page's new man? That's right. Manson's my name. Andrew Manson. Hmm. Mine's Thomas. I've got the carriage here. Get in. Manson climbed into the carriage, which was badly in need of repair, and they drove in silence through several streets of small, dirty houses. Old Thomas, whose body gave off an unpleasant smell, kept looking strangely at Manson. At last he said, You've only just left college, eh? Andrew smiled. I thought so, old Thomas said scornfully. The last man left ten days ago. They never stay for long. Why? Andrew asked, trying to hide his anxiety. The work's too hard for one reason. And what are the other reasons? You'll soon find out. After leaving the centre of the town, they drove across some rough ground near a coal mine, and then up a narrow, stony road to a house close to the rows of small miners' houses. This is the house, said Thomas, stopping the horse. Andrew got out of the carriage. The next minute, the front door was thrown open, and he was welcomed by a tall woman of about fifty. Well, well, you must be Dr. Manson. Come inside. I'm Dr. Page's sister, Miss Page. I am pleased to see you, she said with a friendly smile. Our last man was of no use, but I'm sure that I can trust you. Come with me, and I will show you your bedroom. Andrew's room was small and cold, with very little furniture. Andrew looked round the unwelcoming room and remarked politely, This looks very comfortable, Miss Page. She smiled. Yes, I think that you will be comfortable. Now, come and meet the doctor. She paused and then added awkwardly, I can't remember whether I told you in my letter that the doctor is not well at the moment. Andrew looked at her in sudden surprise. Oh, it's nothing serious, she said quickly. He'll soon be fit again. She led Andrew to the end of the passage, where she opened a door and called out to her brother, He is Dr. Manson, Edward. As Andrew entered the hot bedroom, which smelt of sickness, Edward Page turned slowly in his bed. He was a big man of perhaps sixty, with tired eyes 
and an expression of great suffering on his face. The light of the oil lamp shining onto his bed showed that one half of his face was stiff and lifeless. The left side of his body had no strength or feeling at all. These signs of a long and most serious illness gave Andrew a shock. There was an awkward silence. I hope that you won't find the work here too hard, Dr. Page remarked, speaking slowly and with difficulty. You're very young. I'm twenty-four, sir, Andrew answered. But I like work, he added quickly. Page looked at Andrew and said in a tired voice, I hope that you'll stay. Goodness, what a thing to say, cried Miss Page. She smiled at Andrew and then led him downstairs to supper. As Andrew followed her, he felt worried. No mention of Page's illness had been made when he applied for the post. But the doctor was so ill that he would never be fit to work again. Andrew asked himself why his sister had kept this fact secret. You're lucky, doctor, Miss Page remarked as they went into the dining room. There will be no surgery for you tonight. Jenkins has attended to it. Jenkins? He mixes the medicines. He's a useful man, prepared to do anything. He's been acting for the doctor and attending to all the patients during these last ten days. Andrew again looked at her in surprise. Was this how country doctors ran their practices? Miss Page rang a bell, and a servant with a pale face brought in the supper, looking quickly at Andrew as she entered. Come along, Annie, cried Miss Page. This is Dr. Manson. Annie did not answer. She served Andrew with a small piece of cold meat, which he ate without tasting it. During the meal, Miss Page was silent. Then she sat back in her chair and described in a friendly manner the medical system at Drenefi. All our patients are miners, she explained. The mining company has three doctors on its lists, each of whom employs a younger doctor to help him. Dr. Page now employs you, and Dr. Nichols employs a shameful man called Denny. And then there's Dr. Bramwell. Each miner chooses which of the three doctors he wishes to see in times of illness, and the company pays part of his wages each week to the doctor whom he has chosen. The doctor gives a fair share of this money to his helper and keeps the rest for himself. She stopped and looked at Andrew. I think I understand the system, Miss Page, he said. Well, she gave a short laugh, all that you must remember is that you are working for Dr. Page. Uh, never forget that. She looked at the clock and then quickly rose from her chair. Her manner suddenly changed. There's a woman ill at number seven Glidar Place. Her husband sent for the doctor a long time ago. You had better go down there immediately, she ordered Andrew. Chapter 2 Fever Andrew went out at once. He was eager to begin. This was his first case. It was still raining as he crossed the black, rough ground and made his way to the main street. Darkly as he walked, the dirty town took shape before him. Shops and ugly churches, large and cold, filled the street. The sense of being buried deep in the valley of the mountains made Andrew tremble. There were few people about. Beyond the shops and churches, on both sides of the street, were rows and rows of houses. And at the far end of the town, lighting up the watery sky, were the Drenefi mine workings. Andrew reached number seven, Glidar Place. He took a deep breath and then 
knocked at the door. He was admitted at once to the kitchen, where the patient lay in bed. She was a young woman, the wife of a miner named Williams. As Andrew went over to her bed, he suddenly felt a great sense of responsibility. He was alone. He must find out what was wrong with the woman and cure her, with no other doctor to advise him. While the husband waited and watched in the cold, dark room, Andrew examined the woman with great care. He could see that she was ill, very ill. But what was the cause of her illness? Andrew could not discover the answer. He felt very anxious. His first case. He must not make a mistake. He examined the patient a second time. But he still did not know what was wrong with her. At last, he turned to her husband and asked, "Did she have a cold?" "Yes, doctor, three or four days ago," Williams answered eagerly. Andrew, trying to appear confident, said cheerfully, "Then I'll soon make her better. Come to the surgery in half an hour. I'll give you a bottle of medicine for her." He quickly left the house and walked back in the rain to the surgery, an old wooden building in Page's garden. He lit the gaslight and walked up and down the room, trying to think of any illness from which the woman might be suffering. He knew that it was not really her cold that had made her ill; she had something far worse wrong with her. Feeling very annoyed with himself for his stupidity. He took some bottles from a shelf and mixed a medicine. He had just finished this and was putting the woman's name and address onto the bottle when the surgery bell rang. Before Andrew could answer this, the door opened, and a short, powerful man of about thirty walked in, followed by a dog. The man, who wore an old suit of clothes and dirty shoes, looked Andrew up and down. At last he spoke. I saw a light in your window as I was passing by, so I decided to come in and welcome you. I'm Denny, employed by the great Doctor Nichols. Philip Denny lit his pipe, threw the match onto the floor, and walked forward. He picked up the bottle of medicine, smelt it, and then put it down again. Excellent, he said. So you've begun the good work already, medicine every three hours, the usual nonsense. When in doubt, give medicine. There was silence in the wooden building. Suddenly, Denny laughed. Why have you come here? He asked. By this time, Andrew's temper was rising. He answered angrily, "I want to turn Drenefi into a famous medical center." Again, Denny laughed. <laughs> clever, clever, my dear doctor. Then suddenly, his manner changed. Listen, Manson, he said. There are one or two things about this place that you ought to know. The medical system at Drenefi is very bad. There's no hospital, nor anything else that a doctor needs. The place is so unhealthy that people often die of fever, usually through drinking the bad water. Page was a good doctor, but he's a sick man and will never work again. Nichols, my employer, thinks only about making money, and Bramwell, the other doctor in the area, knows nothing. And I, I drink too much. I think that's all. Come, Hawkins. We'll go. He called the dog and moved heavily towards the door. There he paused, took another look at the bottle of medicine, and then added, "I advise you to consider typhoid fever in Glidar Place." The door closed noisily, and Denny and the dog disappeared into the wet darkness. Andrew slept badly that night. Denny's remark had raised another doubt in his mind. Was it typhoid? 
As he lay in bed through the long night, Andrew asked himself if he knew anything at all about the profession of medicine. Next morning, he ate his breakfast quickly and then went to the surgery. Jenkins was already there, mixing the medicines. There's no need to come here so early, doctor, he said. I can give the men their medicines and sick notes. It's not necessary for you to see them. Thank you, but I wish to see them, Andrew answered coldly. He paused and then asked quickly, What are you putting into those bottles? Jenkins smiled. Water, doctor. I colour the water to make it look like medicine. The patients don't know. They think it makes them better. After the morning surgery, Andrew drove with old Thomas to Glidar Place. He called at number seven and then visited six other houses where people were now complaining of headaches and sickness. In each case, Andrew found definite signs of fever. He realised with sudden fear that the fever was already spreading. He decided that he must speak to Dr. Page at once. Dr. Page, what's the best thing to do with cases of typhoid fever? he asked. Page replied with closed eyes, Fever has always been difficult to deal with. I advise you to telephone Griffiths, the area medical officer. He paused. But I'm afraid that he's not very helpful. Andrew ran down to the hall and telephoned Griffiths. Hello? Hello, is that Dr. Griffiths? After a short silence, a man's voice answered, Who wants him? This is Manson of Drenefi. I work for Dr. Page. I have several cases of typhoid fever. I want Dr. Griffiths to come here immediately. I'm sorry, but Dr. Griffiths is out, on business. When will he be back? shouted Manson. I don't know. But listen... But the speaker at the other end had gone. Manson swore loudly. Turning round, he saw Annie, the servant, beside him. Dr. Griffiths is never at home at this hour of the day, she told him. He's out enjoying himself. But I think that it was Dr. Griffiths who spoke to me. Annie smiled. Perhaps. When he is at home, he pretends that he's out. I shouldn't waste your time on him. That evening, while attending to his surgery patients, Andrew decided to see Danny. It was he who suggested typhoid, he reminded himself. I hate him, but that doesn't matter. I must go to him at once. Denny showed no surprise when Andrew visited him. Well, have you killed anybody yet? he asked in his rude manner. Andrew reddened. You were right. It is typhoid. I've come to ask your advice. Denny gave a faint smile. Then you'd better come in. Sit down. Have a drink? No, I didn't think that you would. For a few moments he sat in silence, pushing the dog Hawkins with his foot. Then he pointed to the table and said, Look at that. On the table stood a microscope. Andrew looked through this and saw on a glass plate the bacteria that were responsible for the fever. You have typhoid cases too, then? Andrew asked with interest. Four, and all in the same area as yours. These bacteria come from the well in Glidar Place. Andrew looked at him in surprise. The sewer is the cause of the trouble. Denny continued. There are holes in it, and the dirt flows through these into the well. I've reported the matter to Griffiths several times, but he refuses to do anything. It's shameful, Andrew almost shouted. He got up and moved towards the door. Thank you for the information. In future, I shall order all my patients in Glidar Place to boil their water. 
It's Griffiths who ought to be boiled, Denny laughed. We shall probably have to see more of each other before this situation improves. Come and see me any time that you can bear it. Going home by Glidar Place, where he left orders regarding the water, Andrew realised that he did not hate Denny as much as he thought. Denny's behaviour seemed strange to Andrew, and when he arrived home, he decided to look up his qualifications in one of Page's old medical books. He found that Denny, who came of a good family, had been educated at an English university and had qualified with good degrees at one of the best hospitals in London. Denny was, in fact, an excellent doctor. He gave his patients the best possible attention and treated them with great kindness. But he refused to give medicines unless they were necessary. Many doctors did not trouble to find out what was really wrong with their patients, but just gave them useless medicines. This made Denny bitterly critical of medical practice and accounted for his strange behaviour at times. Chapter 3 The Sewer Andrew worked hard to cure his fever cases. Now that his patients were drinking only boiled water, they quickly began to get better. I am succeeding, he called out in delight. Then, one day in November, just before lunch, Denny telephoned him. Manson, I'd like to see you. Can you come to my house at three o'clock? It's important. Very well, I'll be there. Andrew ate his lunch in deep thought. As he ate, Miss Page looked at him suspiciously and asked, Who telephoned you? It was Denny, wasn't it? I told you not to see that man. He's worthless. Andrew replied angrily, You're wrong, Miss Page. I have found him extremely helpful. He's a bad doctor. He refuses to give medicines. He's so rude, too. I forbid you to see him. They finished their meal in silence. After lunch, Andrew walked slowly up the street towards Denny's house. Philip greeted him with the news. Young Jones died this morning, and I have two new typhoid cases. Andrew looked down at the floor in sympathy, hardly knowing what to say. Don't look so pleased about it, Denny said bitterly. You like to see my cases get worse while yours get better, but if that sewer... No, no, Andrew interrupted. I'm sorry. Honestly, I am. We must do something about the sewer. We must write to... It's no use writing letters, Philip cried. There's only one way to make them build a new sewer. What's that? Blow up the old one. Andrew was not sure if Denny had gone mad. But you're not being serious. Denny looked at him with scorn. You needn't help me if you don't want to. Oh, I'll help you, Andrew promised. All that afternoon, while visiting his patients, Manson wished he hadn't made the promise. Denny's plan was too risky. If they were discovered, they would both be dismissed from their posts. Andrew trembled at this thought. He was angry with Philip, swore a number of times that he would not go. But for some reason, he could not break his promise. At eleven o'clock that night, Denny and he set out with the dog Hawkins. It was very dark and wet, and a strong wind blew the rain into their faces. The two men, each of whom carried explosives in his coat pockets, walked quickly along the empty streets. When they reached the sewer in Glidar Place, they broke open the lid, which had not been lifted for many years, and then shone a light inside. Nice, isn't it? said Denny. See the holes in the wall? Look, Manson, look for the last time. No more was said. They placed their explosives inside the sewer, 
put back the lid, and then ran up the street. When they were only about 25 metres away, there was a loud explosion. We've done it, Denny, Andrew said excitedly. Five more explosions followed, the last so loud that it could be heard all down the valley. There, said Denny, that's the end of that particular cause of misery. Almost immediately, doors and windows opened and people ran out of their houses. In a minute, the street was crowded. Making good use of the darkness and the noise, Denny and Manson hurried home. Before eight o'clock the next morning, Dr. Griffiths arrived on the scene. He had been sent for by several of the most important men in the town, who told their medical officer in loud voices so that everyone could hear that he had neglected his duty most shamefully. When they had finished with him, Griffiths walked over to Denny, who with Manson stood in the crowd listening to the angry exchanges. Well, Denny, he said, I'll have to build that new sewer for you now. Denny's face showed no expression. I warned you about this several months ago, he said coldly. Don't you remember? Yes, yes, but how could I guess that the thing would blow up? It's a mystery to me how it happened. The work of building a new sewer began on the following Monday. Chapter 4 A Visit to the School It was three months later, and Andrew was beginning to like the dirty old town and its strange but kind people. Feeling extremely happy, he went out one afternoon to see a small boy of nine, whose name was Joe. He was not very ill, but as the family was poor, his illness seemed likely to give the boy's mother a lot more work. At the end of his visit, Andrew remarked to her, You must still keep his brother home from school, I'm afraid. Joe's mother looked at him in surprise. But Miss Barlow said that I needn't keep him at home. Although he was sympathetic, Andrew felt annoyed. No, oh, and who is Miss Barlow? he asked. She's the school teacher. She called to see me this morning. Andrew did not reply. But on leaving the house, he walked straight to the school to see this teacher. When he entered the classroom, all the children were sitting at their desks. Miss Barlow was facing away from him and did not notice him at first. Then, suddenly, she turned round. She was so different from most school teachers he had met that Andrew paused uncertainly. Are you Miss Barlow? he asked awkwardly. Yes. She was a small, attractive and well-dressed young woman of about twenty-two. She looked at him for a moment and then smiled. You work for Dr. Page, don't you? Never mind about that, he answered coldly. I am Dr. Manson. You have a boy here whose brother has a serious disease that could spread to other children. He ought to be at home. She smiled again. Yes, I know. Her refusal to treat his visit seriously made Andrew lose his temper. Don't you realise that you are breaking the rules by allowing this boy to come to school? His manner now made Miss Barlow angry, but she replied quietly, Most of the children here have already had the same illness, and the others are certain to catch it in any case, and if he didn't come to school, he would miss his free milk, which is doing him such a lot of good. He ought to be at home. You must send that child home at once, Andrew ordered her. Her eyes showed her anger now. I am in charge of this class. You may be able to tell people in other places what to do, but here I 
give the orders. You're breaking the law, he shouted. I shall have to report you. Then report me, Miss Barlow replied. She turned to the children and said, Stand up, children, and say, Good morning, Dr. Manson. Thank you for coming. The children rose and politely repeated the words. She then showed him out of the door and gently closed it behind him. Chapter 5 Christine Manson wrote several letters, but he tore them all up again. He felt angry with himself because he had lost his temper. He decided not to report the schoolteacher. He tried to forget the matter, but he could not dismiss Christine Barlow from his mind. Two weeks later, when he was walking down the street, Mrs. Brownwell called out to him, Oh, Dr. Manson, I want to see you. Will you come to dinner tonight? I've invited three other very nice people, Mr. and Mrs. Watkins from the mine, and the schoolteacher, Christine Barlow. Manson's face lit up with pleasure. Well, of course I'll come, Mrs. Bramwell. Thank you for asking me. For the rest of the day, he could think of nothing but the fact that he was going to meet Christine Barlow again. After the evening surgery, he hurried round to the Bramwell's house. He felt very awkward. He did not dare even to look at Christine during dinner, and he did not address a single remark to her after the meal. He wanted to speak to her, but he did not have the courage to do so. But when the dinner party ended, he spoke to her as she was leaving the house. Miss Barlow, may I take you home? he asked. Thank you, but Mr. and Mrs. Watkins have already offered to take me, she told him. Andrew felt very disappointed. I want to say that I'm sorry he said suddenly. I behaved very badly. Your decision about that boy was right. I admire you for it. Good night. He did not wait for her answer. He turned round and walked down the road. For the first time for many days, he felt happy. Andrew had never been in love before. He was afraid to fall in love, afraid that it might get in the way of his work. But he could not control his feelings for Christine. He wanted with all his heart to see her again. Then, one day in May, he received a note from her inviting him to supper. On the following evening, he almost ran to the house where Christine lived. He arrived early, before the Watkins, who had also been invited. Christine gave him a warm welcome. He was so pleased that he could hardly speak. It's been a lovely day, hasn't it? he said, as he followed her into the living room. Lovely, she agreed. I went for such a nice walk this afternoon. She sat down. How nice it was to be here with her. Her room, full of her own possessions, was pleasant and comfortable. He felt relaxed and began to ask her questions about herself. She answered him simply. Her mother had died when she was fifteen, and four years later her father and brother had been killed in an accident in their coal mine. Now she had no relatives. People were kind to me, she said. Mr. and Mrs. Watkins were especially kind. I came to work at the school here. She paused. But I'm like you. I still feel strange, a little lonely here. He looked at her. It's easy to feel lonely here. I often wish that I had somebody to talk to. She smiled. What do you want to talk about? He turned red. Oh, my work, I suppose. 
I seem to have so many problems, he explained. Do you mean that you have difficult cases? No, not really. He paused. When I came to Genefi, I imagined that a doctor's life would be very pleasant. But now I am discovering that it is far from that. The system is all wrong. For example, a patient comes to the surgery for a bottle of medicine and is given coloured water. It isn't right. Doctors don't take enough trouble to find out what is wrong with a patient before treating him. They are always in such a hurry. Christine was about to answer when the doorbell rang. She rose, saying, I hope that you will tell me more about this another time. Mr. Watkins and his wife came in, and almost at once they sat down to supper. It was a good meal and nicely served. After supper, Mr. Watkins told stories which made them all laugh. The evening passed quickly. When Andrew looked at his watch, he saw, to his surprise, that it was nearly eleven o'clock. Sadly, he rose to leave. He thanked Christine, who went with him to the door. Please, can I see you again? He paused. Will you... Christine, will you come out with me one evening? She smiled. Well... I might. He wanted to kiss her. He held her hand for a moment, turned, and ran down the path on his way home. Oh, she was a lovely girl. And he had called her Christine. Chapter 6 Curing a Madman Andrew felt happy, hopeful. This feeling of excitement influenced his work. He wanted to do something to make Christine proud of him. For the next few weeks, he had only very simple cases to attend to, such as cuts on the hand and colds in the head. He began to ask himself if a doctor in such a lonely place would ever have an opportunity to do work of real importance. But then, at six o'clock one morning, he was woken by Annie, who, with tears in her eyes, gave him a note from Dr. Bramwell. Andrew quickly opened the envelope and read, Come at once, I want you to help me with a dangerous madman. It's my brother Emlyn, Doctor, said Annie, wiping her eyes. He's been ill for three weeks. During the night, he suddenly became violent and attacked his wife with a knife. Come quickly, doctor. Andrew dressed in three minutes and went with Annie to Emlyn's home. There he found Bramwell, seated at a table, writing. Ah, Manson, thank you for coming so quickly, he said. What's the matter? Emlyn has gone mad. We shall have to send him to the mental hospital at once. But, of course, they will not admit him unless a second doctor signs my report, saying that he is mad. That's why I sent for you. What are your reasons for considering him mad? Andrew asked. Bramwell read out his report. It certainly sounds bad, Andrew agreed, when Bramwell had finished. Well, I'll examine him. Emlyn was in bed, and seated beside him, in case he should become violent again, were two of his friends from the mine. At the foot of the bed stood his wife, who was crying. Andrew had a sudden feeling of coldness, almost of fear. He went over to Emlyn, and at first the man hardly recognised him. Andrew spoke to him. Emlyn gave a reply that did not make sense. Then, throwing up his hands, he shouted and threatened Andrew. A silence followed. Emlyn showed all the signs of madness. But for some reason, Andrew doubted whether he was really mad. 
he kept asking himself why Emlyn should behave like this. There might be some other medical reason. He touched the man's swollen face and noticed with surprise that his finger left no mark. At once he saw the cause of the trouble. He finished his examination to make certain that he was right and then went back to Bramwell. Listen, Bramwell, he said, trying to hide his excitement. I don't think that we should sign that report. What? But the man's mad! That's not my opinion, Andrew answered. In my opinion, Emlyn is only suffering from a hormone problem. Bramwell was too surprised to speak. Let us try to cure him instead of sending him to the mental hospital, Andrew suggested. Before Bramwell could argue, Andrew went out of the room. A few minutes later, he returned with Emlyn's wife and told her, with Bramwell listening, what they planned to do. Two weeks after starting Andrew's new treatment, Emlyn was well enough to leave his sickbed, and in two months he was back at work. One evening, he and his wife went to the surgery and told Andrew, We owe everything to you. We would like you to be our regular doctor in the future. Bramwell knows nothing. He's a silly old fool. You can't change doctors, Andrew answered. That would not be fair to Bramwell. But Andrew felt pleased that they wished a change. And as soon as they left he went round to Christine to tell her of his success. Chapter 7 Freddie Hampson In July, an important meeting of British doctors was held in the Welsh capital, Cardiff. Andrew had not intended to go to this meeting, because of the cost, but a few days before it began, he received a letter from his friend, Freddie Hampson, urging him to attend and inviting him to have dinner with him on the Saturday evening. Andrew showed the letter to Christine, with whom he was now very much in love, and asked her, Will you come with me? I'd like you to meet Hampson. I'd love to come, she said. On Saturday, Christine and Andrew took the train to Cardiff. Andrew smiled at Christine who sat on the opposite seat. He wanted to kiss her, to hold her in his arms. Rather breathlessly, he said, We shall have a happy time this evening. Freddy's a nice man. You'll like him. When they reached Cardiff, they went to the hotel where the meeting was being held. Hampson had not yet arrived. So they stood together, watching the doctors and their wives talking and laughing. After some time, Freddy arrived and headed towards them. Hello, hello. Sorry I'm late. Well, well, it's nice to see you again, Andrew. I see that you're still the same old Manson. Why don't you buy yourself a new suit? Suddenly noticing Christine, he smiled and ordered Andrew, Introduce me, man. Wake up. While the two doctors were in their meeting, Christine went out to look at the shops. Then, in the early evening, they met up again in the hotel. Over dinner, Freddy began to talk about the days when he and Andrew had studied medicine together. I never thought then, he said in a rather scornful manner, that you would bury yourself in the country like this. Do you really think that he's buried himself? Christine asked coldly. There was a pause. Freddy smiled at Andrew. What did you think of the meeting? I suppose, Andrew answered doubtfully, that the discussions help to keep one's knowledge up to date. Oh, I don't take any notice of the discussions. Heavens no. I've come here to meet the doctors the important doctors who will be useful to me in my profession. You'd be surprised how many useful men there are here. When I return to London, 
I shall invite them to a meal. Then we shall do business together. I don't understand, Freddy, Manson said. It's simple. When rich people come to me, I shall examine them first, and then send them to a second doctor to see if he agrees with my opinion about their illness and the treatment to give. In return, these doctors will send me some of their patients. The patients then have to pay each of us. That's the way to make money. Freddy laughed. You ought to come to London one day. Then you and I could do business together. Christine looked quickly at Hampson, was about to speak, but then stopped herself. And now, tell me about yourself, Manson. Freddy continued, smiling. What have you been doing? Oh, nothing much. Most of my patients are coal miners and their families. That doesn't sound very good. I enjoy my work, Andrew said. Christine interrupted. And you do important work. Yes, I had one interesting case recently. Andrew began to tell Hampson about Emlyn, but Hampson was not really listening. At ten o'clock, Andrew and Christine left. As they walked back to the railway station, Andrew asked, Did you like Hampson? No, not much. She paused. He's too pleased with himself. He considers himself to be so much better than you. I hate that way of talking. Andrew seemed surprised. I agree that he is rather pleased with himself, but he's really a very nice man. You must be blind if you can't see the kind of person he is. He only thinks about himself. Andrew had never seen Christine so angry before. They entered the railway station. Andrew wanted a quiet talk with Christine, to clear up their little disagreement, and to tell her of his love for her. But the train was crowded, and they could not be alone. It was late when they reached Drineffi, and Christine looked very tired. So he took her home and said good night. Chapter 8 Baby Morgan it was nearly midnight when Andrew reached the page's house. He found Joe Morgan waiting for him. Morgan and his wife had been married for twenty years, and now, to their great joy, they were expecting their first baby. Oh, Doctor, I am glad to see you, said Joe. My wife, come quickly. Andrew ran into the house for his bag of instruments, and then hurried along to Morgan's home. I'll wait outside, Doctor. <laughs> I'm too worried to come in, Morgan said when they arrived. Inside, a narrow staircase led up to a small bedroom, which, though clean, had very little furniture and was lit by only an oil lamp. Here Mrs. Morgan's mother and a fat nurse stood anxiously by the bed, watching Andrew's expression as he moved about the room. Andrew smiled. Don't worry, he comforted them. He knew that this case would demand all his attention. As there was nothing that he could do for the moment, he sat down and waited, thinking of Christine. At half past three, he went over to the bed and saw that he could now begin his work. It was a long and difficult birth. Then, just as daylight was beginning, the child was born, lifeless. As he looked at the baby's still, white body, Andrew turned cold. Quickly, he gave the child to the nurse and turned his attention to Mrs. Morgan, who was also close to death. Working with great speed, he seized a bottle and gave her a medicine to make her heart stronger. He then made a feverish effort to save her by other means. After a few minutes, her heartbeat strengthened. Seeing that she was out of danger, Andrew turned round to the nurse and shouted, Where's the child? 
the nurse looked afraid. She had put the baby under the bed. At once, Andrew knelt down and pulled out the child. Still kneeling, he examined the boy and decided that there was just a chance of bringing him to life. He jumped to his feet and ordered the nurse, Get me some hot water and cold water. Bowls, too. Qu quickly! But doctor, quick! he shouted. When the bowls arrived, Andrew filled one with the cold water and the other with the hot water. Working with great speed, he then placed the baby first into one bowl and then into the other. He continued this operation for fifteen minutes, but the baby showed no sign of life. You're wasting your time, doctor, said the nurse. It's dead. But Andrew took no notice. He put the baby into hot and cold water for another fifteen minutes. Having again achieved no success, he then made a last and more determined effort, pressing on the baby's little chest, trying to get breath into its still body. Suddenly, the baby made a movement. Gradually, its white face and body began to turn pink. After a few more minutes, it started to cry. Good heavens, the nurse cried. It's... It's come to life. Andrew handed her the child. He felt weak, almost faint. His dirty instruments, cloths and bowls lay in pools of water on the floor. Mrs Morgan was asleep, not knowing what had been happening. Her mother stood by the wall, praying. I'll come back for my bag later, nurse, Andrew said. He went downstairs to the kitchen and put on his hat and coat. Outside, he found Joe. All right, Joe, he said. Your wife and son are both safe. It was nearly five o'clock. A few miners were already in the streets. As Andrew walked home, he thought, I've done something. Oh, God, I've done something good at last. Andrew had a bath and went downstairs to breakfast. Miss Page, having discovered that his bed had not been slept in, gave him a severe look as he sat down at the table and remarked, You got home late? I suppose you were out enjoying yourself all night, drinking or getting into some other kind of trouble. You're as bad as all the other men we've employed. You can't be trusted. Andrew was too angry to reply. After the morning surgery, he went back to the Morgans. As he walked down their road, women whom he had never met smiled at him in a most friendly manner. When he reached the Morgans' house, he received a very warm welcome. He went upstairs to the bedroom. The little room, which had been so untidy only a few hours before, had been cleaned and polished, and his instruments carefully washed and put into his bag. There were clean sheets on the bed. The nurse rose from her seat, and, smiling at the mother and baby, said, They look very well now, don't they, doctor? But they don't know how much trouble they gave us. Mrs. Morgan tried to express her thanks. We are very grateful to you, Doctor. Has Joe been to see you yet? she asked. No. Well, he's coming. Before Andrew left the house, the old woman gave him a glass of wine. Two weeks later, when Andrew had paid his last visit of the day, Morgan, who was about to go abroad with his wife and child, called to see him. Money can't pay for all that you have done for us, but my wife and I would like to give you this little present, he said, handing Andrew a cheque for five pounds. But I can't accept this, Joe, Andrew said. He knew that the Morgans had very little money. You must accept it. We want you to, Joe told him. 
It's a present for yourself, not for Dr. Page. You understand? Yes, I understand, Joe, Andrew said, smiling. He took the cheque to the Page's bank and told the manager, Mr. Reese, that he wished to open an account. Reese looked at the cheque and asked slowly, Do you want this account to be in your own name? Manson was surprised at the question. Yes, why? Is the amount too small? Oh, no, Doctor. We're very pleased to do business with you. Uh, you did say that you want the account to be in your own name? Yes, of course. All right, Doctor. I just wanted a check. Good morning, Dr. Manson. Good morning. Manson left the bank, asking himself what the manager meant. It was some days before he was able to answer the question. Chapter 9 Joe Morgan's Check Christine had gone away for a holiday, and Andrew felt lonely without her. The weather was hot and tiring, and life seemed dull. Then one day, Watkins sent a message asking him to call at his office. The manager of the coal mines greeted him in a friendly manner. Listen, doctor, he said. Emlyn and a number of the miners want me to hire you as one of the company's doctors. Andrew looked at him in surprise. You mean... I mean, Watkins said slowly that I would like to add your name to the list of doctors so that any man who wishes to can leave Dr. Page and make you his regular doctor. I couldn't agree to that. It wouldn't be fair to Dr. Page, Andrew replied. It wouldn't be honest. Watkins was disappointed. Think about my suggestion, doctor, he urged Andrew. It's no use. I couldn't do it, he said firmly, though sadly. Wishing that he had never been offered this opportunity to improve his position, Andrew tried to take his mind off the matter by going to see Denny. But to his disappointment, he found that Denny had been drinking and could neither behave nor talk sensibly. Andrew put him to bed and left. The next morning, after surgery, he went back to Denny's house to see how he was. He found him in an even worse condition. Swearing about Denny and the summer heat, Andrew hurried out to visit Philip's patients as well as his own. When he called on him in the evening, Denny shouted, The medical profession! It's the worst system in the world! It's not honest. Give me another drink. He paused. Manson, you're a good man. I love you better than a brother. You and I should work together. We'd soon change the whole of this profession. Denny nearly fell over, and Andrew put him to bed for the second time. For the rest of that week, he did all Denny's work. Then, on Sunday, Denny was quite well again. I understand that you've been doing my work for me, Manson, he said in a cold voice. His manner was so cold that Andrew left the house at once in anger. He behaves as if he has generously allowed me to do his work, Andrew said to himself. But his anger soon left him. He was fond of Philip and respected his honesty and skill as a doctor. When Andrew reached home, Miss Page shouted at him. Is that you, Doctor? Dr. Manson? I want you! What's the matter, Miss Page? He answered with annoyance. She came up to him. What? You may well ask. Kindly explain this, she said, 
holding up Joe Morgan's check. Raising his head, Andrew saw Reese standing behind Miss Page. Yes, you have reason to be surprised, Miss Page continued. Perhaps you will explain why you paid this money into your bank account instead of into Dr. Page's? Andrew felt hot with anger. It's my money. Joe Morgan gave it to me as a present. A present? It's easy to say that now that he's abroad. Write and ask him if you doubt my word. I do doubt your word. You are trying to take over Dr. Page's practice. This shows the kind of man that you are. You consider only your own interests. Andrew moved towards them, his eyes on Reese. Miss Page, he said, unless you take those words back within two minutes, I shall bring an action against you in a court of law and I shall punish your bank manager in a way that he has never been punished before. I, I only did my duty, the bank manager said weakly. I'm waiting, Miss Page, Andrew warned her. She realised that she had said too much. I, I'm sorry. Andrew took a quick, deep breath. Miss Page, there is something that I want to tell you. Last week I was invited to become an official doctor to the mining company, but I refused the offer because I did not consider it fair to Dr. Page to accept. Now I am so tired of you that I have decided to leave. I give you a month's notice. She looked at him in surprise. Lies! All lies, she shouted. You can't give me notice. Andrew said nothing more. He went upstairs to his room and closed the door. Chapter 10. A New Post Andrew began to search at once for another position. But he did not receive a single answer to his letters. He became very worried. How was he to live? Then one day, when walking sadly down the street, he met Denny. Knocking out the ashes from his pipe, Philip said, I'm sorry that you're leaving, Manson. He paused. I heard this afternoon that the Aberallor Medical Society is advertising for a new man. Aberallor, that's fifty kilometres down the valley. Why don't you try for the post? Andrew looked doubtful. Well, yes, he agreed slowly. I could try. He walked home and wrote to the society. A week later, Andrew and seven other young doctors went to Aberallor to be examined by the society's committee. It was a fine summer afternoon, and Andrew liked Aberallor, which was larger than Genefi, with good streets and shops and green fields surrounding the town. But I won't get this post, he told himself, as he waited his turn for examination. The other men were better dressed and seemed more confident than he. But what would Christine think of him if he failed? She would return to Genefi either today or tomorrow. He had not told her about the post. He wanted to surprise her and to win her respect by greeting her with the good news that he had been given the post. Andrew, the third man to be examined, entered the committee room with a feeling of fear and determination. About thirty miners were in the room. At a small table sat a pale man with a kind face. He was Owen, the secretary. Owen, in a quiet voice, explained the medical system at Aberallor. The miners pay part of their wages each week to the society, and out of this money the society provides the medical services, including a hospital. The society employs a head doctor, Dr. Llewellyn, four other doctors to help him, and a dentist. 
Each doctor receives a payment for every patient on his list. Owen turned to the committee. And now, gentlemen, do you wish to ask Dr. Manson any questions? Several voices began to shout questions at Andrew. He answered them calmly and returned to the waiting room. The next man then went in. The last man came back from his examination with a smile of satisfaction on his face. I'm the winner, his expression seemed to say. There was another long wait. At last, the door of the committee room opened and Owen came out. He called out, Will you come in for a minute, Dr. Manson? The committee would like to see you again. His heart beating fast, Andrew followed the secretary back into the committee room, where he was welcomed by smiling faces. Owen now addressed him. Dr. Manson, we will be honest with you. The committee, on Dr. Llewellyn's advice, had intended to hire a doctor with experience in this valley, but the committee now feels that you may be a better choice. Andrew was too excited to smile. I should add, Dr. Manson, Owen continued, that the committee has been influenced by two letters received from doctors in your own town. One is from a Dr. Denny, who has a very good degree, and the other, enclosed with Denny's, is signed by Dr. Page, by whom you are employed. These two doctors praise your work so highly that the committee would like to offer you the post. Andrew lowered his eyes, his thoughts on Denny's generous act. There is just one difficulty, Dr. Manson, Owen added. This post should really be given to a married man. The miners like their families to be attended by married doctors. Also, a house is provided. There was a long silence. They were all looking at him. At last, Andrew said calmly, That is all right, gentlemen. I am going to marry a girl in Drineffi. There were loud cheers. Then, Dr. Manson, you are appointed, said Owen. When can you start your duties? I can start work next week, Andrew answered. Then he turned cold as he thought, Suppose that Christine won't marry me. A few minutes later, Andrew left and excitedly ran to the railway station to catch the next train home to Drineffi. When he reached Drineffi, he went straight to Christine's house to see if she had returned from her holiday. Finding to his joy that the light was on in her room, he rushed into the house. Christine? She looked at him in surprise. Andrew, how nice of you to come round. Chris, I have something to tell you. A worried expression spread across her face. What has happened? Have you had more trouble with Miss Page? Are you going away? He shook his head. Christine, I've got a new post, an excellent post, at Aberallo. Five hundred pounds a year and a house. A house, Christine. Oh, my dearest, Christine, could you... Will you marry me? She went very pale. Her eyes were bright. She said quietly, And I thought that you were going to tell me some bad news. No, no, the best news, my dear, he cried. Oh, Chris, I love you so much, but perhaps you don't love me. She went towards him and laid her head against his chest. As he put his arm round her, she said, Oh, Andrew, dear, I've loved you ever since... ever since I saw you walk into my school.'